Right, so we are continuing our journey in the book of Jeremiah, kind of jumping around a little bit. We're actually going to be in chapter 17, verses uh, 5 through 13. This whole chapter here in chapter 17 is pretty much talking about how truly deceitful that uh, our hearts are, or that as, as from the fall of the garden, how that has made every man truly uh, deceitful in their hearts. That when we always hear that quote that no one is good, no not one, that we read in the old in the New Testament. Well, this is all coming from the prophet of Jeremiah. When the New Testament is quoted, it's coming from Jeremiah, and this is the original section here in verse 5 starting in verse 5 God's word says thus says Yahweh curses a man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh its strength and whose heart turns away from Yahweh and he will be like a juniper in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes but will dwell in the stony waste in the wilderness the land of salt which is not inhabited Blessed is the man who trusts in Yahweh, and whose trust is Yahweh. And he will be like a tree planted by the water that sends forth its roots by a stream. It will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor refrain from yielding fruit. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who could know it? I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the, inner, the inmost beings, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his deeds, as a partridge that hatches eggs, which it has not laid. So is he who makes a fortune, but unjustly, in the midst of his days, it will forsake him. And in the end, he will be a wicked fool. A glorious throne on high from the beginning is the place of the sanctuary. O Yahweh, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away on the earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of the living water, even Yahweh. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we come to you with this piece of scripture in Jeremiah about the wicked heart. We understand that we're all wicked, that we all have hearts that can never equal up to the glory, to the glory of your Son. Father, today allow us to understand the Scripture, to understand what the prophet is telling us this morning, and that we can take it and utilize it, and we can we can understand who we are and understand how others are. We ask all of this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we start off in verse 5, and... And one thing you notice in Jeremiah is that Jeremiah, every time he quotes Yahweh, every time he quotes God, he always states that it's coming from God. Um, we can take into account that Jeremiah never wanted it to be his own words. That he never wanted to say, well, I spoke to God and now I'm saying this to the people. He always says, thus says the Lord, or thus says Yahweh, as it states in the Legacy Standard. He wants to make that clear, that it's not coming from his own words, that it's always coming from God. And we see that from all the prophets. We see that in Isaiah. Um, we see that all in the minor prophets from Haggai and so on, that all of them always says, thus says the Lord, or thus says God, so that it's not mistaken that it's coming from them. Because it's not about them. It's not about us. It's God's word. It's what God is telling through the prophet. It's what God is saying through him to tell the people. So at the beginning, always notice that when it's God speaking or when Yahweh is speaking, that it's always at the beginning that He's going. To, they're going to say, Thus says the Lord. This is not coming from, my, from me. It's not coming from my heart. It's not coming from my mouth. It's from the Lord. And it says, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength. We know that our flesh does not make us strong. That the world is 
that we shouldn't trust in man. We should never trust in man because if we trust in man and we trust into to things made of the world, then it's going to lead us down a path that is not glorifying God. We see that a lot of the times we, we trust in mankind. We, we trust in their thoughts. We trust in their hearts. In all reality, if we trust in our hearts or trust in their hearts, then we're trusting in deceit. We're trusting in Satan. We're trusting in the, in the evil because we're all evil. There's, It says no one is good. No, not one is purely good. It's because God is only good. Jesus was the only perfect one that walked this earth that was sinless, that was not full of sin. He was the pure one. And every man born after that or before that was not good. They will not be good. So it says, whose heart turns away from Yahweh? So we see that if you're made of, if you work through the flesh as your strength or you trust in mankind, then, then truly your heart is turning away from God. Your heart is turning away from them because you're trusting into worldly things and you're not trusting into godly things. You're not trusting into things that are going to ultimately glorify God. And as continues to say, and now he's using using these different images throughout the scripture. He's using things such as, and he will be like a juniper in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes. So, he will continue to just flow throughout the desert and not understand his direction. He will not understand his guidance. And he will not ever see prosperity coming. And I don't want you to think that prosperity means... Here, it, it, it doesn't state that prosperity is financial or that prosperity is something that's given to you. Prosperity in this sense, what the prophet is saying is prosperity is being prosperous with the Lord. So prosperous with the spirit. I think when we hear prosperity, we automatically think money. We think of homes. We think of, of nice stars. financially things. Right. We think of things that can make us happy, you know. But here in the scripture, when it says, he will not see when prosperity comes, it's about being prosperous with the Lord. Um, a lot of times we, this is the most, this, this scripture is the most twisted by prosperity preachers. Oh, I bet. Because they'll see, well, they won't see when prosperity comes. Well, well when prosperity comes, then then I can go buy a Benz or yeah. I can go buy a big, big fancy jet or a new home. They'll use this piece of scripture from Jeremiah and to twist it into their own deeds, to their own things that can make them more rich or more happy. Um, and that's not really what he's saying. He's talking about prosperity with the Lord. He's talking about that's, that's the ultimate prosperity. That's the ultimate. You want to be prosperous, but you want to be prosperous with the Lord. If the Lord blesses you with a a um, hundred thousand dollar car then that's what the Lord desires for you to have right. but the Lord could bless you with a, a used car that can get you from point A to point B and that's enough right. then you're prosperous because you didn't have that before right. and so that's what the prophet's saying is and he will not see when prosperity comes because he won't be prosperous because if he's fallen if he turns away from Yahweh he turns away from God then he's truly not gonna he's not gonna be prosperous. There's gonna be no form of prosperity when you're turned away from God. So if you're living uh, um, if you're living your life in your own flesh of your own strength and you turn away from Yahweh, then you'll be like a, a juniper into the desert. You're gonna flow with no direction. You're gonna constantly go in each and every direction in life. And you know, we we see that with people who are not part of the Lord. We see that with people who are not Christians is we can see their lives just kind of flow. But their lives are not 
focused on the Lord. So they go down different paths that are not glorifying God. They go down different areas that you're like, wow, why are why are they going through that? Why are people suffering? Why are, are things like that happening? And it's because of their own decisions and it's because they're not they're not a Christian and they're not glorifying God. You know, I'm not saying that if people are in a different country or stuff suffering from famine and all that, that they're not Christians. No, half of them actually are practice more Christianity than we do here in the United States. But they they are living, they are breathing, and they are surviving because of the prosperity from the Lord. You know, and it's, just, it's the same way we see here. We, we may see loved ones or we may see friends or acquaintances go down different paths and you're like well why are they going down that path and it's by their own decisions because if you're not glorifying God with your decisions and you glorify your flesh with your decisions then you're going to go down different paths you're going to go down addiction you're going to go down all these other things the only way you get out of that is by God the only way you get out of that is by the glory and grace of God that you can get out of those different things and so, continuing on in Scripture, it says, But will dwell in stony waste in the wilderness. Stony waste in the wilderness. That's, that doesn't sound like something you would want to dwell in. But here, he, he's, he's speaking clearly of being lost. Of being to where there's no direction, there's no vision for the ones that aren't connected with God. For the ones that are truly living for their in their flesh, when so you live in your in your greed, if you live in your your heart by your decisions, you are not capable of glorifying God. You are totally depraved in your heart, and this is coming from the Lord. The Lord's telling the telling the prophet that the Lord's saying you speak to the people because, in understand this too. Jeremiah speaking to the people. So obviously the Lord's seeing all these different things that are going on in the land and are like, that's not what you should do. You're listening to your heart. You're not listening to me. You're not letting me guide you. And so that's why Jeremiah is speaking to the people. And it, it continues on in verse 7. It says, Blessed is the man who trusts in Yahweh. So now we see an opposite reaction here. So it says... The cursed is the man that does not trust in Yahweh. Bless, blessed is the man who trusts in Yahweh. Blessed is the man who trusts in God. And I want you guys to see this image here where Jeremiah is going to put this. And he says, And he will be like a tree planted by the water, okay, that sends forth its roots by a stream. Now, why do you think he stated sets forth its roots? What happens to roots when they grow? They get stronger. They get stronger. They expand. Right? How often do we see in our own backyard, we see trees back there and we see roots and they take up half the backyard because they continue to grow. They continue to get stronger. I think that's one of the hardest things to do is to get roots out of a ground because they continue to go down and grow. Mm -hmm. And they do get stronger. And then we see, and will not fear when the heat comes, when obstacles come, when things come into our lives that they will not fear. When you are strong, rooted like, we, like the scripture says, in Christ, in God, that the heat, no matter what comes your way, will never deter you from going the opposite way. Understand, once we are saved and we are Christians, we cannot go back from that. You can't be unsaved. You can't be saved and go unsaved. That's what he's saying here. He said you will not fear. You won't have fear if you walk, in the, walk with the Lord. There will be no fear. There be nothing that can deter us. Nothing that can take us away from, from that relationship, from, from that love, from that compassion of being in a relationship with God. 
And it continues on and says, but its leaves will be green. So when we see the fall during during the fall of the seasons, the leaves are green. Some of them fall off, but they grow again. But they're completely green. And it says that you won't be anxious in a year of drought. So, so no matter what the situation that we're going through in our lives, no matter how hard it could be financially or how hard it could be when you leave, when a loved one leaves or, or anything that we may think is very devastating in our lives, it says you won't be anxious. And why do you think we wouldn't be anxious? Because we're going to lean on we're going to lean on God. We're going to lean on Him for understanding. We're going to lean on Him for compassion. We're going to lean on Him to to know that even if a loved one were to leave this world, or we were to go through a financial heartbreak, it's only temporary. It's never everlasting. So it says here that it will not be anxious in a year of drought. So your tree will not be anxious in a year of drought. That no matter what happens, that it will continue to grow. And this piece here at the end of verse 8, and it says, nor refrain from yielding fruit. From yielding our fruits to show who we are, that show that we're showing the love of Christ, that we're showing the compassion of Christ, the understanding of Christ, that we're showing that we are, you know, we're there for the needy, that we're there for others, that we're, that we, we understand people are going through hardships. Understand that we can, when we see people, the way Christians are to label people, they are to label them by their fruits what they show, how they treat others, how they, how they have compassion for others, how they communicate with others. They say that judgment, that we shouldn't judge, but we are to have righteous judgment, and we are to see how others are by how they show their fruits. So if you were to say, well, this person is a Christian, this person is a Christian, well, we can tell that by how we truly view their fruits. We can tell them how they act towards others, how they treat others, how they treat their family, how they treat uh, people inside of the church, how they treat their children. We can tell that by their fruits, by what they show. And this is what he's saying here too. It says that you would not refrain from yielding fruit, that you would not refrain from showing others your fruit. That's a true Christian. And there's another piece of scripture when we talk about in John, talk about being the vine, the, that God, Jesus is the vine, and that we are to have orchards off of the vine. That we are to have fruits off of that. That Jesus is the vine, he is there, and we are to grow off of him. Where do you think he got that from? From the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament when it says that we would not refrain from yielding fruit fruit on the tree and our roots will continue to grow through the stream that's where John got that from that he's, he's saying that we are to, to show our fruits that we are not to yield it from others that we are not to, <coughs> to show to, to keep it tucked in that we are to say well I'm just going to show my family these fruits no we are to show others in the community our fruits we are to show others that we run across every single day in our fruits. We have three people here that work in, um, with people every day. To the capacity, some more than, than others. And I'm not saying you don't either because you run across people in grocery stores. I don't want my wife showing up fruits to nobody. <laughs> <laughs> we are to show the compassion to others that we run across. We are to show love to others. Um, we are to, to show those emotions of a Christian. That's what the scriptures are, are saying. And we, like I said, we run across people every single day, no matter where we go. If we walk outside the house, we're, we're going to run across people. We go to the store, we, we walk past 30, 40 people every day. 
You yeah. never know. All it could take is a smile to somebody and say, hey, how are you? It could lighten somebody's life, lighten somebody's day. You never know what people are going through. And so that's what the scripture says. Is, Do not yield your fruit. Show your fruit. Show it to others so that they can see that, that the love of Yahweh is inside and it says here in verse 9, here is, here is where we see a description of the heart. Okay, Verse 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can know it? Because our hearts are not lined up with Christ. Our hearts from the beginning of the garden, from the fall, made our hearts deceitful. But you know what, what is crazy when we speak about the scriptures? Is our hearts were never meant to be that way. God created man and, and woman. They were meant to, to flourish in a land that had no sin. Had no sin. Then the fall happened. And the description here is that the heart, our hearts are deceitful than all else. We idolize other things. We lust over things. There's so many different characteristics inside of our heart that is not glorifying to God. That's why when salvation happens, you are to be made new. Because you're you're made, you're born deceitful. You are to be made new. Doesn't mean that you're not going to sin. You continue to sin, but you recognize your sin. You are to turn away from your sin. In the 19th chapter of our London Baptist Confession that the Grace Bible holds true to, in the first chapter, says God gave Adam a law of universal obedience written in his heart. Originally, he gave him obedience that was written in his heart in a particular precept of not eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, of not eating it, by which he bound him in all posterity to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience promised life upon the fulfilling and threatened death upon the breach of it endued him with the power and the ability to keep it so here he, it's it's saying that if he breaks it death he didn't ultimately kill Adam but he lived a life of with a dead heart because the heart was originally meant for obedience. Once again, in the garden, you see a tree. Jeremiah, Yahweh speaking about a tree. It's all coming. It all comes together. It all flows together. It originally gave Adam a heart of obedience. His free will, he decided to go and disobey creating lineage every single person besides Jesus with a dead heart with a deceitful heart with a sick heart here in verse 10 it says I always search the heart I test the inmost being even to give each man according to his ways according to the fruits of the deeds he tests the innermost beings. He searches the heart. He searches what you have inside your heart. According to your ways. According to how the fruits of your deeds are. The things you do, He tests you by how you act. He tests you on how you are treating each other. He tests you on how you treat your family. He tests you on different things inside of your life. He is the tester. So he watches you when you when you throw stuff at your parents too? Yeah, he watches you when you do anything. Okay. He 
tests all of that. He tests all of that, and, and it, but it says here clearly that we're all just desperately sick inside of our heart. That we're truly desperately sick, that we are to turn away from those things. We are to see the things that we do inside of our lives that don't glorify God, and we are to turn away from them. So at the end of verse 10, it says, according to his ways, according to the fruits of his deeds. Verse 11, it says, as a partridge that hatches eggs, which it has not laid, so is he who makes a fortune, but unjustly, in the midst of his days, it will forsake him. And in the end, he will be a wicked fool. How clear is that? that in the midst of your days that you're going you're going to forsake God in our hearts we're naturally going to sin we are naturally going to do things that don't glorify him here <laughs> so is he who makes a fortune but unjustly in the midst of his days will forsake him like mine at the bottom down here. What does yours say? Well, at the very bottom when it breaks down the scripture, I guess, it says it was commonly believed that partridges would steal the eggs of other birds, but uh, hatchlings would return to their natural parent in the same way a person will not be able to retain riches unjustly gained. So, clearly... It says that no matter what you gain in this world, no matter what you can think of, of riches, of prosperity, of anything like that, that it's never good enough. It's never going to ultimately equal up to God, to equal up to the riches from Him, to the Spirit, to everything that He gives us. And then see, that was good there because... Because inside those study notes, we're able to kind of understand the scriptures a little bit more clearly. Yeah, you got the scripture, and then down here, it kind of breaks it makes down. it to where you can understand it. Because that's what I do. I look up here, and then I come down here Perfect. and read it again, because it helps me understand it. What does yours say with it being the NLT? What? What does yours say with it being the NLT? I'm wondering if it's any... It's 17, probably, 11. 17, 11. Jeremiah cited a general principle that was not necessarily universal. Those who have gained wealth by unjust means eventually lose their, those riches. That's the same thing like, like some people who, and even rich people. One I know of that lives in, used to live in New York, now he lives in Florida. Gain that means by being deceitful, and pretty soon the no. day will come. It, it comes back. It, it always Close comes back. Because it's it's not about gaining, you know, you, you gain riches by blessings, but you don't gain riches by by stealing or by doing all, all these other things. Being deceitful. Right. Yeah. And so there, I mean, you always speaking clear of saying, hey. Like that's not what you're supposed to do, and understand on judgment, judgment day when when you go up there and you are to answer to all your sins, to all the things that you didn't do to glorify God, and, and you know some people got it in their minds that they can just say, well, I messed up, I'm sorry. Well, he doesn't want to hear that. He don't want to hear that. He wants you to understand, like I did mess up, but there's Jesus, and I trust in Him. And this is what I know I did wrong. He wants you to understand what you did inside your heart. It's not that he wants you to say, oh, I didn't know anything about that. He wants you to lean on Jesus for, for that sin. It doesn't say that Jesus is your gateway out of everything. Because you are to understand what you do. You are to repent and to turn away from it. But verse 11 was really clear with just talking about unjustly gaining that, that that financial means that is not glorifying God whatsoever. 
Here in verse 12 it says, The glorious throne on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. We're talking about God. We're talking about the glorious one, the glorious throne on high. We know that Jesus sits next to God and reigns with him. And scriptures speak clearly that one day when we go, that we will be ruling with Jesus, that we will be sitting next to him, and we will be glorifying God every single day with the angels. And that's that's what gives us all the comfort, all the comfort in the end that we know that God is on high, that he lives in, that he is the gatekeeper, that he is the man. Jesus is ruling next to him. And it gives us comfort knowing that one day we will be ruling as well, that one day we will be sitting with him. I think the older I've gotten, the more I've understood that when a loved one does leave here, whether they are whether they are going to glorify in heaven with God or they could be damned to hell either way, that it, God makes a decision for that and understand that that the world is temporary, that we live in a temporary world. You know, a lot of Egyptians and other rulers and stuff like that back in the day lived for like 300 years, but that's not suitable for us. That's that's not that's not possible for us that we are going to live for a certain amount of years that are, are written and known by God as predestined from the beginning of time. But we understand that the, the comfort is is that we will be in heaven. Or as a Christian, if you are a Christian and you are devout and you follow Him, that you will be in heaven. And there's no way around that. If you're a Christian and you know that you are, that gives you another. See, that gives you comfort living your life. See, if, you, if you're not a Christian, you don't have that comfort and that knowing that you're going to be in heaven for the rest of your life. But uh, for for eternity, for for complete eternity, and it's all known by God, foreordained from the beginning of time, that He knows who is going to be there. His elect will be there and celebrate with him and worship with him every single day and it's not even days up there there's no t well, there's no time there there's no adjustment of time there's no noon oh today's noon in heaven no it's you're here there's no there's no sense of that but we understand that for eternity we will celebrate with the Lord and we will be there uh, verse 13, and this is our last verse for this morning. It says, O Yahweh, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away on the earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of the living water, even Yahweh. Having hope for the people, that the hope is Israel, no matter what they have done, and here Jeremiah is speaking clearly to him, saying, All that will forsake you will be put to shame. All that will not live in that life with you will ultimately be damned and will be put to shame. Will soon be forgotten. Yep. Those who turn away on earth will be written down. And so those who turn away from Yahweh will be written down. What does that mean? When he talks about written down, they got your um, number. Yeah. Peter. Yes. Peter, whenever you're going in for judgment day, if your name is not written in the book of life, you don't get into heaven. Yep. Saint Peter has your number. Yep. If you're not written down in the book of life, and that's what he's speaking here, and we we see it here. It says those who will not be written down, those who turn away on earth, will be written down. And it's clear. It's clear. If you're not in the book of life, you will not be in heaven. You will not be there. I just have one sentence from 13. What I said, they will soon be forgotten. Yep. Written in the earth, they will soon be forgotten. Because they have forsaken the fountain, living water, even Yahweh. 
You have forsaken the fountain. You have forsaken God. You have forsaken the the flowing of riches of pros, prosperity of of living in comfort of living in a loving life with the Lord. They have forsaken that out of their own choice when you truly don't have a choice. The non-elect will live like the world. The elect will live like God. That's how clear it is. When you are part of God's elect, you will live to glorify God. If you are not part of the elect, you have deeds and you have nasty, rotten fruits that will show the complete opposite. You have worms. Yes. Which is not glorifying God. And you will not have beautiful flowing leaves of fruit on your tree. Instead you will have fruits that act like the world. You will have fruits that show the opposite of love. You will have fruits that do not show Jesus. You have fruits I ultimately do not ever and will never glorify God. You are not capable to glorify God when you are not part of the elect. You don't have the, the capability inside your heart because you were never created to do so. You were created to be deceitful. You were created to not even have fruits. You were created to live like the world. To act like the world to be conformed to the world and it tells us not to be. Does anybody have anything about this? These pieces of scripture this morning? If not, we can go ahead and pray. Uh, what I took from it really is like whenever I was thinking the whole time like people tell you to follow your heart like that's a big thing that people whenever you're trying to like make a decision people be like follow your heart. If I followed my heart, I'd be in a hell of a lot more trouble than I am. Uh, well, it depends what your heart feels and does. Well, our heart is deceitful what, by nature. Yeah, but... Because if we go by... your mind tells your heart. Well, our, our heart is deceitful, and so we have to follow God, not our heart. Because if we follow our heart, those decisions are still going to end up... I followed my heart at 18 and uh, got hurt. Because I didn't follow God. Follow the wrong people, that's what well, I, I was following my heart. Yeah, but when you follow your heart, it says it's wicked. It's deceitful. There's nothing good about your heart. There's nothing good about it. The only good there is is God. And that's why when there's a decision to be made, you know, we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to pray for guidance, not just go off of what we feel. Because our emotions are very misleading. And then the other thing I took from it when it said, um, sorry, you kept going so fast, I didn't have a chance to. When it was talking about the, um, oh, whenever you, uh, not being able to recognize the good, I think a lot of that too is um, a lot of times we're so focused on what we want that when we are blessed with something that we don't tend to even recognize it. People recognize that it's a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of see, I guess it's hindsight. Yeah. With it all. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for being here uh, this morning and mm-hmm. here at Grace Bible. A little bit, if you're watching or listening, as we're a house church, we're we're out here in Hepsbud, and we're we're, uh, we're just doing doing God's work. We're gathering every Sunday morning, so if you would like to join us, we we'd love to have you uh, out here in Hepsbud Grace Bible Church. So, if we don't have anything, uh, if you anything we can pray for you about this week, just let us know, and we'll, we'll be in prayer. So, let us pray, Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you with this piece of scripture in Jeremiah and we've learned that that our hearts can never equal up to the heart of Jesus that uh, no matter what we do that it's deceitful above all things that we are to lean on on God and lean on Yahweh for understanding so we can allow our fruits to show that we can flourish in this 
deceitful world that we are to be different, that we are to to show the love of Christ, that we are, no matter what kind of persecution may come our way, no matter what we go through, that we are to show Christ in everything that we do. They were to love others the same way Christ loved others, that we are to be compassionate to others' needs, that we are to be compassionate to, to others' ideas. Father, allow us to, to show all these things. We've learned so much this morning through the prophet Jeremiah that we are to see these things and that we are to recognize our sin and turn away from these sins. We understand it all came from the garden. We understand what Adam did and that we all come from Adam. But we are to, to conform to Christ every single day of our lives. Father, be with us this next week as we continue this be with us as we as we go to work. Be with us as we as we live our lives. Father, we're thankful for the blessings. And we're the honor to bless, to, to, to praise you, to worship you every single day. In Jesus' name we pray.